to kick things off, we thought we'd um, have a little blast from the past. Is that an excerpt from a program called OSM, which broadcast um, in Manchester, um, hosted by the amazing Tony Wilson, maybe rest in peace. Broadcast 1988. That's right, yeah. Quite a significant year for you. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. It was the year I kind of discovered that I could make music outside of my um, little bedroom studio. It was an uh, interesting year and all because I'd just discovered the sampler. I think it was an S900 Akai. And um, we figured out that you could reverse a sample so when I um, recorded something, and up until till then I only recorded on a Tascam four-track machine, mm -hmm. which I started to do in 1986, I think, um, something like that. Anyway, I discovered that you could record a track and grab the vocal and reverse it and play it um, back like repeatedly. Um, I wasn't expecting that it would create a really hypnotic sound and I was also, at the time, really new to um, a mixing desk, which like, I think now is my instrument. So I, I use a mixing desk like how maybe some people might use a piano or something like that. And um, I figured out that you could actually layer stuff. That was, that was really uh, a groundbreaking time for me. Yeah. 1988. But what um, was striking about the setup that you had there was, uh, you know, you obviously took your music live quite quickly. Yes. Oh yeah, it was live yeah. before um, anything else actually. Before I was playing professionally with any kind of turntables or stuff, I mm. was using Roland equipment mm -hmm. to um, make music live. I was like inspired by um, like the soul and funk and electro that was coming out of like um, the United States of America in the uh, early 80s, from about 82. I think one of the first tracks I um, like got, as in got how it, how it was actually done, was by Africa Mambata, produced by Arthur Baker, um, called Planet Rock. And um, I'd kind of been listening to a lot of the jazz and funk stuff and the new machine at the time in the studios was like um, the Roland 808. And I think um, also they was using the SH-101 and some people were using the 303. And they were the new machines that, they sounded a bit plasticky for people who grew up on acoustic sounds. Your key tools at the time were the 808, yes. Roland 808, 909, uh, Juno 106, Analog yeah. Synth. Um, what else did you have going at the time? And more importantly, how did you connect everything together to make it kind of um, work effectively? Well, basically, they, I, I thought, I mean, and I still do think that that was more than enough. Um, and it was pre-MIDI, so um, I was basically using CV and Gate in the later stages when I figured out what the little sockets were for. Because um, there was no... Way of, there was no manuals or anything or information that came with the second-hand machines. You had to figure it out yourself. I um, then found that the jack plug that had clock on the back of the 808 could be plugged into the SH-101. Mm -hmm. And then, like a few years down the line, I figured out that the little red um, flashing lights on the SH-101 was actually a sequencer. So I started to... Um, <laughs> build tracks using the sequencer in the SH-101. And then something said to me, if I have two SH-101s, then I have two sequencers. And then, no, I've got three sequencers because I've got the 808 too. And um, also there's a sequencer in the 303. So I'd, I kind of thought of things in ways of like all the separate pods and I actually writing sequences in different things. So. I mean, sometimes things got a bit in intricate because like everything was sequenced, it wasn't cut or pasted. So like I had basically, like the drums were written as a song. 
the bass was written as a song, the lead part was written as a song, and they, they were all kind of interwoven together. And where something was too much, I would take it out or mix it out or mix too it Too much in. as in volume, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. or um, actually when I discovered um, like reverb and delays and things like that, then I realized that you could actually use these things to position things. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered stereo imaging, and then it was like, wow, you can actually create a whole picture with all these separate sequences and all these effects, and you can basically put things together in different spaces and create um, different sounds and emotions and moods. Saving patches was something that wasn't so straightforward, was it? It was all on the fly. Yeah. Okay. You, I mean, basically, the, the um, emphasis was more on um, pushing like the sounds and the sequences and like making patterns and trying to fit the patterns together more than um, actually making things in blocks. I think round, round about that time and all, um, there was the start of Cubase and Pro 24, which was I think the early Logic. And like a lot of people were, were using like the, these early computer systems, but um, I was a little bit um, kind of frightened by that system because it basically meant that everything was in these blocks okay. and I couldn't kind of swim in and out of the sounds like I used to or like I was used to. And um, I actually enjoyed like sometimes the serendipity of when a delay would go over into something else and these blocks kind of meant that you know everything was totally controlled and like um, you knew exactly what was going to happen. So from, I guess, from uh, an analog pattern-based um, CV gate approach, I guess you know, the next phase was to perhaps incorporate some samplers at some point? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, because I, it, the, the sampler series, for me, anyway, was I always used like this Akai stuff. Mm. And um, I kind of actually started to use it because I was traveling a lot. So I was on the road a lot with, with all these drum machines and stuff, and they were falling apart. Um, and I needed a way to actually move around and use the 727-909-808 and stuff like all in the one place. Mm -hmm. So um, actually the, the first thing I, I um, got was, it was called um, an ASQ-10. Okay. In, um, Son in Sonic, wasn't it? it yeah. No, it, it, was, it, was, it was the first Akai Oh, um, the Akai's, Akai's, the, the, the sequencer uh, that the pre -MPC for the MPC 60. 60. Yeah, remember, yeah. And um, I used to use like a, a few like um, Akai S9, S900s mm -hmm. and like um, for the drums and stuff, I would kind of put them in one sampler and then basically, so I was trying to do the same thing, mm -hmm. um, but using like um, the samplers. So I, I would leave all the kind of like instruments at home and just bring like the samplers out. Okay. And then I guess they, it was slightly easier as well because they were all midied as yes. opposed to CV gates. Yeah, exactly. So slightly easier to control. It was it yeah. was easier to control and I, it kind of um, meant I could write things like on the road too, like because um, I could like put everything through just like this one little line mixer and write. So it's really cool. And then like um, Roger Lynn teamed up with Akai mm -hmm. and they created the MPC60, mm -hmm. which um, totally changed everything for me because um, it meant I could basically have all the drums and everything on one floppy disk, which was really cool. And then I could uh, have the sequences of, and everything all in the same machine. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, I was still um, using tape. Okay. And on the back of the MPC-60, there was um, Simpty in and out. So I could clock, when I was in a studio, I could clock the, the MPC-60 with the tape machine and just press play on the tape machine and everything would roll. And what I needed to put on tape, I could put on tape. And, uh, and yeah. it all worked together. It really, it was <laughs> so tight. It all all um, worked together. Simpty was basically used for films, for clocking the sound with film. So syncing the sound with film. So it really worked like really well. Just to recap, so you went from, I guess, using the hardware Roland trilogy, um, yeah. and then you sampled those off put those into Akai samplers, so to speak. Yeah. Said bye-bye to the 
you know, were they, would you sell them off or just keep them in the studio? They're just in the studio, yeah. basically. Do you have people yeah. going, why are you using that guy's sample? Where's the 106? Um, no. Where's the 808? That's only become trendy of lately, you know. Okay. People want their records scratched. They want, like, <laughs> analog stuff and all this now. They want to see the flashing lights. Yeah, back then, like, they weren't really bothered. I mean, it's about ease, wasn't it? Right. Most of them were off their tits. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was great because uh, it was like the future, you know, mm -hmm. we'd, we'd moved on. I, I was like, I was virtual. I could leave stuff at home. I could write things at home and then take it out on the road. And, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of didn't really matter if I dropped a sampler on the, or, or a floppy disk on the floor or something. As long as you had a backup, right? Yeah, exactly. As I long mean, as you had a backup, right? It meant you could back up. Mm -hmm. And for the first time mm -hmm. and all, it actually meant I could um, program things and, so I had memory for the first time, so I, I actually could write like more intricate things and add them into the mix. So from heavy to slightly lighter, from MPC 60 to MPC 2000, you'll say? Slightly? No, I never actually, never, by the time never went there. 2000 came out. I, oh, I you'd, mean, you'd, you'd, you'd have gone here, I've, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'd moved on a little bit. I mean, I really liked the programming on the, the 900, S900, the Akai, and the 950. By the time it got to the S1000, S um, I'd kind of moved away a little bit. And, well, not moved away, but I'd kind of, in, in the studio, I went kind of back to the S900 because I, I was doing more like um, jungle stuff. And uh, I loved the loop on it, the, this reverse forward loop. So I used to write a load of things with like this reverse forward loop. And um, because I had no memory restrictions, I, I was still, up until 2002, still recording everything onto tape. So I used to go onto two-inch mm -hmm. multi-track tape because I didn't actually trust um, computers <laughs> that much until then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this like um, forward reverse thing was really cool, and I got really good at dropping in on tape. Mm -hmm. So like I used to do like drop-ins and tape and. I found uh, a really interesting way to make really heavy B lines from using the tone. Okay, yes. Mm. Um, so in, in, the, in the sampler? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I, I'd, mm. I'd like kind of um, layer like the tone with other basses and create like this like trouser fluttering mm. kind <laughs> of B line. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, in them days it was important because it was like all about jungle. Of course. Before drum and bass. So what year are we know. talking here? Um, like 92. Um, so yeah, it was all about beeline in '92 and like making like the drums really sharp and powerful and kind of making sure that everything was like um, I don't know fresh or different. You know, we wanted different sounds. Everyone, well, in my little area, everyone wanted to be different and stuff and have a their own flavour mm -hmm. kind of vibe. So I kind of came with my own little little thing. And at one point, did you decide to step to um, have the confidence and courage and conviction to go from hardware to using... To computer. Uh, yeah. Um, really funny, actually. I was um, at uh, the house of uh, a friend who plays guitar, mm. and um, I had the computer with me, and like a load of other people turned up. Um, it was like, I was at Finley Quay's house, okay. and um, Roland Boland, who's the son of um, like um, this guy, Mark Boland. Mm -hmm. He turned up and some other people and they were all playing percussion and like we had no way of recording. I was like, oh my God, like, you know, what do I do? And they were like, you've got Cubase. Because at the time I had Cubase in the, and it was the version five or something okay. and uh, with all the VSTs. So I basically just stuck it on and started recording nervously mm -hmm. and like layering stuff and it sounded great. And I was like, oh my God, like, um, and then I realized that the, the, I could use the, the desk in there the same as I would use a mixing desk. So I... Um, so I, under duress? Yeah, yeah under duress okay. I, yeah. I moved to the computer and then like I slowly got into it. I was uh, actually on one of these um, old Macs at the time, the G3. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided that, yeah, it's really easy this to, to use. And I mean, I still, in my mind, I says, I'm going to take it all back to the studio and put it all on tape, sure. you know, but then like, um, like a few years down the line, it was like the tape machine just got dust on it and <laughs> I left it in New York. 
And for a brief time in Cubase, you decided to go to another door, right? Well, mm. the thing about Cubase is like you had to use these VST instruments, and um, at first they were really cool. And I was, but then it got to that thing again where I was using loads and loads of them, and I didn't know what they were doing. And sure. and then I discovered. I mean, I, I knew about um, Rebirth, mm. and but I never used it. But then I discovered that they'd made this other software called um, Reason. So I thought, oh, well, I'll try that out. And I couldn't believe how like, stable it was compared to like, anything else at that time. I just got really addicted. Actually, I was on um, the road with um, Bibel Gilberto, who's like a kind of Brazilian singer. Mm -hmm. like, amazing, but like more contemporary. Who's the, the daughter of Joel mm -hmm. Gilberto. And the percussion guy actually had a uh, copy of um, Reason. And he showed me it and I was just like, oh wow, it's really cool. I mean, like, I think it was version two or something. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like it was really color coordinated, like automatically, I mean, like depending on, our, on how hard something was hit or whatever. So I could see where everything was. And um, actually got then into doing a little bit of this like editing and stuff. Mm -hmm. and. I realized, yeah, you could have like 10 drum machines if you wanted and all this, depending on like how much power you had in your computer. And I worked like that for, for a little while, making some kind of breakbeat type stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I just decided to move with that more than using like the old analog stuff or the, the samplers, you know. And, but I think now it's like it's one of the things where I realize that there's some people that never came that journey, and like when they see me using this this stuff, they're like, "Wow, you know, it's, how come you're using computers?" And it's like because they've only started off with computers, most a lot of people, sure. so they they don't really. They, I mean, like one, once I I've actually sat down and watched some young people working. I realized that they, they work in a totally different way from me too. You know, I, I'm still like imagine, imagining like um, samplers and keyboards, sure. which I kind of grew up with. So, I mean, what strikes me about Reason, you know, because I've, I've known for a while that you've, you've been a Reason head, you know, and I think knowing your past, it almost like makes complete sense why, you know, again, thinking analog, thinking, you know, Victoria Bar was 1988. Yeah, CV and it's Gate. Got a, yeah, it's got a very kind of analog <laughs> approach to, yeah. to writing, you know, rap based. Can you kind of, for people who aren't familiar with Reason, just give us a brief, I guess, uh, look at the interface. Okay, so this at the top is like, um, is the hardware interface. This is how you connect to like a um, sound card or something like that. And like down there, you'll have like your channels to show you where things are coming in and out. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, on this, I mean, I shouldn't have put that out as cheated really, but like I've got like this um, mastering thing there so I can level things out if it gets a bit too heavy. You can have that there or not. Um, you can actually build your own, what they call combinators, mm -hmm. like with your own special bits and pieces in there. Like this is the mix put, the mixing desk. And like from here, it's, a, it's pretty basic. I mean like on the, the newer versions, um, they've actually got um, like an SSL desk, which is like you get compression and everything on each channel and like all that and loads of different EQs, but I keep I kind of keep it pretty simple. And like, if you want to add something, say like I want to add a, a drum machine or something, or like a loop player, this is a subtractor synthesizer. So when I see a subtractor, I'm seeing a, like an SH101 or something like that for some strange reason. Um, and basically, I'm gonna because I'm gonna do it step time, so I'm gonna put like a step time sequencer, which is this um, matrix pattern sequencer. So I'm going to put that underneath it. Yeah? And that usually comes like with a, let's see if this is working. You hear that? Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, I could, I could, I could just um, press clear or I could do it like this, you know. Like maybe add a little bit of... So we've got like a tone. Bit of release, yeah. From the, yeah. Uh, so 
then you've got a little bit of uh, resonance in there and some frequency changing. Maybe I change the waveform a little. And then I drop it down a couple of octaves. And then add another note. That's kind of like two notes now. So we've got like a... Building, building. <laughs> bit slow this, innit? <laughs> but like you told me to go from scratch, so... Yeah, uh, no, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. <laughs> this is, this Don't is, wait, I will rush you. I will this rush is, you. Yeah, let me know when you need me to speed up and I'll go, this is what we made earlier. Then what I would do is probably add like my version of a TR-808 or something like that. But you could actually put other sounds in there. Like, oh, let's try this. There's a 909 there. So we'll go for that. Which is more of a techno-y kind of sound in it. Let's hear what's going on. So I guess with Reason comes with preset, um, a big library. Was yeah, one of, you one of the actually, first doors yeah. to have yeah, quite an extensive library. Yeah, you could actually add your own things. I mean, like, it's basically just samples, so you could do your own. So we've got the clap going on. Like, and a little bit of... I don't know, you've got like a couple of basic reverbs and delays. So I'm going to add these actually to the desk. I mean, I'm sure it's all. And you put those in particular order, haven't you? So, because re Reason remembers that yeah. you know, if you've got an effect after the mixer, it will automatically plug yeah, it into exactly, the. Exactly, yeah. yeah it sure. will directly. I'll, in a minute, I'll flip it around and you can see, like, then I maybe add a delay. And then. Um, I'm going to add a bass drum. Yeah, that bass drum, I, I kind of, I like, it's a bit clicky, so i pull it back a bit. So you're just giving a softer attack, I take it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bit of oomph. I don't know, maybe take the sound back a bit. And then, maybe not like the full on Alright, so it's got a little bit of a little bit more going on there. Then like some snares. And like I'm shortening the snare thing I'm a little bit because I'm wanting it a bit punchier. I'm going to take a few of them out. I and mean, that's how I would have usually done it on the 909. And then I had like maybe a open hat. Do the, the typical, was it five? Was it? Say like this this one here, I'll create um, another sequencer for this. I mean, this is just one way of writing. There's like a million and one ways of doing this. But I'll put another um, matrix on the bottom of that there. Well, I've got, maybe I've got a pattern clear first. Clear the pattern. And then go to randomize. Uh, and I've just got this like mess of sound. I mean, I could actually, what I would do, I mean, as a challenge, I could actually go and find another sound, or I could just, just take this sound and, like, really, just, it's all about ADSR, you know, doing all this kind of, for me anyway. It's very much inspiration and tweak, right? Yeah. yeah. Because I really like how that's going, I could either go up here and put a delay on it. It's like that simple, isn't it? Baking a cake. 
Actually, now I'm really bored with that bass line. I like that more. Like that. And then... Just like... What's about with it a bit? Like, so you get like, a very analogue approach to writing, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like, I mean, mm. you kind of... Okay. So the good thing is, um, you know, it's great that we started from the grounds up to kind of see your approach to um, creating. Um, but it also reflects on how you perform live, right? Yeah. Because there's a reason why you have two machines here. It's yeah. never really crashed on me, but like, I know some people, sometimes they get things that crash on them or, you know, like I've had, I have had people try and throw a pint of beer, you know, because they don't think you're doing it for real. So they throw a pint of beer. But like, if one of them's still working, then, you know, people can still... Take heed, everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've always got a backup and all because there's, everything's kind of on the two. Also, like, I can mix between the two. So, like, meanwhile, this one's, like, vibing away. Um, I might want to write something in private, you know, and I can't really take, take something backstage and do it. So I've got, like, earphones, and, like, our DJ queues up with, uh, with um, like, um, the next track and you can't hear it, I can actually start writing bits of melody that go with this what, groove on the other machine and then start putting that in too and vice versa, you know what I mean? So you can do things that way or you might find a bit of a, something that fits in with the other thing and then you, just, you can mix it in slowly or just, you know, it's like really basic. What really, I find really interesting about your approach to music creation and performance is the fact that a lot of your ideas start as we saw mm. um, and the fact that you have this set up pretty much in your studio obviously you've got other yeah. bits of kit but essentially yeah. your hub is this triangle right yeah so you've got two you've got two machines and from what I understand you might start an idea on one machine get and a little bit bored and then start on another machine yeah and yeah. get a bit bored and they kind of play with yeah. each other yeah it's, I mean for me it's like be having two recording studios in the one room mm -hmm. You know, so you can actually, and being able to incorporate two things. So we've had this initial jam. Yeah. That was a collaboration, right? Yeah. You was, know it's a collaboration yeah. between all, it'll be it's written not just as your a, thing. It's been written as a collab. Yeah, yeah. that's it, you know that. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so that'll be running and then say, yeah, so. So this is something that's got like strings and stuff in it and other bits and pieces. various things in there and there's actually some other bits that I've muted out there, you can see. And really quickly on. And that's like a, what I'd call a pick-me-up, you kind of put it on top of the, the beat and it, everything's kind of like malleable and all, so I could like kind of move stuff around or like put reverb on it or whatever. Um, I'm just going to go through this. Like, it's like a string that kind of lightens out the, the whole sound. So, I mean, you can get a sample to do this. But, um, but it's like this classic, um, and like going back to what I was saying before, like that sound traditionally may be used with like a jungle or drum and bass kind of tune. But like on this, it's kind of like a, I mean, I'd, I ain't got a clue what people would call things nowadays. I just try and make it outside of like a mixed bag or, you know, I'm trying to stay away from everything when it comes into the studio. Wipe my feet out the door and leave it all there and just do something how you feel it. You know, take, take some jungle sounds and make an ambient tune or something, you know what I mean? But anyway, I'm not going to go through every single thing, but like there's your, your basis, your, your high stuff, your beat and all that. And then... And what, what I've done on this is I've left this open. So the back patterns, um, are they... Um are they? Are they, are they just long sections? Um, I actually, I can show you the sequencer. It's down here. So it's like a, a whole like um, system. I, I actually set that up for the automation. Okay. So on here, I've got like um, 
like the automation which is basically like that, that would be the song for me so like everything would be kind of flowing through as like loops and stuff like that all the sips and stuff and then i would do my arrangement on the actual mixing desk meaning that i can add reverbs and delays and so i guess each pa- each um each redrum each each part's got a particular length four or eight bars or 16 bars or whatever and then you're using automation to bring things in, in and out in, in yeah things. i mean usually everything is like yeah four or eight okay. bars or something like that and then uh, i mean because in a in a live situation it means i can keep everything like really raw and like as and bring it in as i want and and like not you know what i mean nothing is going to kind of drop out when i don't want it to kind of thing usually so you said it up, but and then you can go through and basically the same thing that I would do that back then I mean for me nothing's changed really it's basically like it's the same I mean I can imagine in like um, I don't know in 50 years time people will be kind of going back and saying oh yeah you know you all use like these phones and like you know we're gonna go back to a tin can you know does the same thing you know you get this tin can bit of string you can still communicate you know what I mean like it's just like the act of doing it and like how you want to do it you know what I mean and, I don't know, I mean, like, I can't really see any reason to go back to the analogue thing. I think use use what we've got, but, like, don't make any excuses, you know what I mean? Just, like, work with it and, and use, I mean, there's some amazing, like, um, machines now, like, that are actually being built by programmers and stuff, you know? Any, any come to mind? Um, oh. I mean, I, I like, there's a, there's a free one, it was like this VST thing called Crystal from years ago, last time. I, I mean, I mean, the only thing I, I really use more when I say it's reason, but like being able to uh, have like, you know, loads of like um, like envelopes, you know, on, on, on it, to, to be able to use them and like paint with paint the sound or like, you know, these tube tech kind of compressors and things. If you know how a compressor works, and you and you use these things that they, and I mean you go into a, a studio I mean like you go into a, a like terrestrial studio and like put one of these things next to a like a real tube compressor you know you can actually get like a, a, a similar or, or the same result you know and I think it depends on the skill of, of who's doing it and not even the skill it just depends on like your ear and what you want and what you you're used to Basically, I think how you want to use the technology. I mean, like, I was getting loads of grief for using the the bass baseline machine in the early days, and like people were laughing and saying, "Look at it, it's a toy," and like now you can't buy one for soft mic. You know what I mean? It's like really hard to, and like these are looked at as serious machines. So, in my perspective, you know, I mean, I'm seeing everything as like really serious machine. You know, because I've I've seen things that have been ridiculed out of the studio now as being like you know if you've got one of these things sure. you... well i think what's interesting i mean as you're saying i mean i think um we've definitely come to a time where a lot of the manufacturers who were making those um instruments um which are now a lot of money on ebay etc yeah. are now kind of taking heed of the market and actually reintroducing some of these albeit in a different yeah. capacity um so it's gonna be interesting how the next few years um shape themselves yeah i, th- yeah. I mean it would be nice i mean I, i'm not saying it would be nice but i think if 
like um, there was more of a kind of energy or focus on actually shaping what we have now mm -hmm. into building something for tomorrow. You know what I mean? I think that's. I mean, that's where I'm. I'm. At. I'm always like techno. I want like the future. <laughs> so, have you got any kind of tips in terms of um, your take on music creation? And the relationship between the music that you, re you write and the music that you perform. Any kind of tips you have for um, anybody trying to emulate you? Emulate who? <laughs> <laughs> Should um, be like you. I would say, be be yourself. I mean, I would I would definitely say. I mean, I would totally give people a template of like you've got like a tone, like you know, which is like ev everyone has a tone, and it's just like find find a sound that you're actually comfortable with. So it's like almost like finding, finding your truth, finding your fingerprint in a way. You know what I mean? I know it sounds like it would be hard to do, but like we've now, we've got all the technology and everything. You can like totally have like your own sounds. I mean, I remember like years ago, someone asking me like, "What do you think music will be like in the future?" And this was when we were still using the hardware stuff, and I was thinking, "Wow, like the stuff that I'm doing with." this um with all this kind of equipment no one's going to be able to appreciate until they're actually doing it themselves and then they can hear what's been going on sure. and but like by then everyone will be doing their own thing you know what i mean and that's what i thought like you know everyone would have their own like it'd be easier to do it you don't have to because like we had to go to like what like thomas was saying to, to record something professionally you had to go to a recording studio so like you could see things being scaled down i could see the pattern of what was happening so I thought by now, everyone would have their own genre. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, okay, you put it out. This is me, this is my sound. I didn't think it would be like, okay, there's a body of music that everyone has to follow. But I suppose because of like the way that the financial thing happened, like, you know, everyone is like, that, that makes like a load of money. So people move in that direction or this makes them a load of money. But like now with um, the MP3s, is like you make like niche. There's nothing to be made on it, so you'd think that everyone would be. But there is still a little bit, I suppose. But like, what I, I find like because it's, it's so kind of in a way it's so homogenous. Like it, you'd think that the best marketing thing would be to stick out, you know, and to make your your own thing. I know it sounds like it would be really hard, but like there's just so much. So much out there. I mean, I can't. I can't say because I'm coming from. I'm coming from the past. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess individual individuality within the noise is the is yeah, the trick. Yeah, I think. Okay, that. okay. On that note, Mr. Gerald Simpson, the guy called Gerald. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Much. Thank you. Thank you, Shun.